I'm glad you sang that song, I Speak Jesus. I found it maybe about a month and a half ago as I was flying uh, to Reynoldsburg, Ohio, where our national office is now located. And I literally listened to that song for probably three or four hours on repeat <laughs> through the whole airport. And I realized that um, I think this is, a, this is a prayer. This is a prayer for our families. This is a prayer for our church. This is a prayer that Jesus wants us to. It's not mine. I don't need it. <laughs> um, that he wants us to, to pray over those that we love and to pray that he would break strongholds. Um, I love, love that song. I cry every single time I hear it. I cried through the airport, and I'm sure people looked at me a little bit weird because I had ear pods on, and here I'm crying as I'm worshiping and trying not to, like, sing it out loud. Um, but I love, love that song. I want to remind you of, yes, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. I want to remind you of where we were last night. Um, we talked about our identity Right, We talked about the fact that we belong to God's family, that we're blessed, that we're chosen, that we're adopted, and we're redeemed. And I want to continue with this topic of family, and we're going to continue in Ephesians 1, and we're going to look at a, a few verses in Ephesians 1, and then we're going to go a couple other places. Because I believe that when we talk about family... There's, there's a reality of what it means to be a part of God's family. We talked about the identity piece, but I think there's a further reality that we learn in the rest of Ephesians. We're going to learn and talk about the sealing that we get. We get sealed with the Holy Spirit. We're filled with the Holy Spirit, and it puts us on mission. I love that we've been hearing stories from Joyce about this mission that she is on, but it reminds us even as Hannah was talking is that we all have stories and we all have purpose and we all have mission. And so we're going to talk about what that looks like in our lives. And so I just want to open us in a word of prayer um, before I speak. Holy Spirit, we invite your presence and Spirit, I'm glad that we don't actually, um, that you're already here um, because you're within us. But Lord, I'm asking for the fullness of your presence to show up in manifest ways. I'm asking that we would sense and we would know and we'd experience you completely tonight. And that you would continue the work of transformation that you're already doing in our lives. And that we'd walk away different as we sit in your word, as we hold on to your truths, as we even talked about yesterday, of what it looks like to really hold on to the truths. So would you speak to our hearts and minds, and we give you this space. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to start, I'm going to have you guys do a little talking in your groups again. Um, I loved hearing the chatter as you guys were talking last night and hearing kind of the things that you were talking about. We're going to talk about family. And I have a couple questions about family, like what is your experience with the word family? You know, some of us grew up in homes that felt safe and secure. And others of us grew up in homes where we didn't feel loved, we didn't feel known. And so some of you might have a negative reaction when you think of the word family. But we're going to explore that together. And I want you to think about what would be the ideal family? How does the Bible describe family, the perfect family? And so I want to give you about five minutes to discuss in your group what is your experience with the word family, what emotions or words come to your mind, what's the idea, what's the biblical definition of family, and then what's the purpose of family. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes and you guys can discuss with those around you.
All right. Hey, guys, I'm going to call you back. I really appreciate the fact that you guys are diving into these conversations because I think it's good for us to sit with this idea of family. I think oftentimes within the American, maybe Caucasian culture, for sure I can speak about my own culture, we think about family maybe as our biological family. Either the family we're born into or maybe the family we marry into. And we hold that up as the highest and most important family. Um, I loved as I listened um, today to Jane, where she talked about how she had to lay down her idol of her family and give it to God, right? And I think sometimes we can make our biological family, our kids, our husbands, our parents, um, our siblings, an idol, and we think of them as the most important. But I want to kind of expand our idea of family, and I'll even share some of my experiences of what it was like to live overseas in the Middle East and what it was like to actually be adopted into a family. And so I, wanna, um, I want you to think about family as it's conveying this sense of belonging. And to be in a family of God means that we're, not, we're accepted. All the things we talked about yesterday, all the things in verses 3 through 4, 13 or 3 through 12 that were accepted, were loved, were cherished, were celebrated. We're forgiven. And the reality is, is there's, there's implications for what it looks like to be the, of the family of God that we're also put on mission, right? One of the things, when I was living overseas, I was living in Kurdistan. I was a single missionary there. And this is in northern Iraq. Um, and I had an amazing family there. I remember when I first arrived, many of the locals said, oh, Stacy, you poor thing. Did you do something wrong that your family would send you here by yourself? <laughs> and because of that, I was welcomed into a family. And I'll show you some pictures a little bit later on and tell you a little bit more of what it meant to be a part of a family. But when I was getting ready to return home to the States for my first home assignment from Kurdistan, I remembered crying and saying, God, I don't want to go home. You've given me a family here. Yeah, my parents, my siblings are home, and my friends are home, but I feel at home here. I feel known. I feel loved. I feel accepted. I've been welcomed in so well into this family of not just locals, but I had an ex kepat community where I had nieces and nephews, and I, I had siblings both in husbands and wives where they just, like, welcomed me in. And I remember praying and saying, God, if I have to go home, would you give me a family? And he did. I went to Nyack College, and I was a missionary in residence, and so that meant I taught classes, and God gave me about 30 children who were in my home almost every night of the week where we had meals together. And I was able to mentor them and walk with them through their journey. And then he gave me a community of people who were in my age at different ages and stages of life as well as some older people who were mentors. And we would weekly meet together at a fire at one person's house and we would do life together. And when we went there, we couldn't talk about our statuses. If they were married, they couldn't sit next to their spouse because they said, we want you to really understand what it means to be a family together, regardless of whether you're married or single, regardless of whether you have kids. And we're going to interact as if we're brothers and sisters, as if we're the family of Christ, which we were. And it was the most beautiful thing. I remember sitting around the fire, sharing my stories, and feeling known and feeling loved, and feeling accepted. My hope and prayer for you guys today is that not only are you feeling that with people that you came with, but you're beginning to experience that with each other. Because we are the family of God. We have one Father who loves us, who accepts us, who celebrates us, and he's inviting us into this family. I love this scripture in Deuteronomy. It says, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. 
the Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possessions. This is talking about Israel, right? Abraham was chosen by God. The people of Israel were the people of God. But we go for, fast forward into the New Testament and we see the same idea in 1 Peter 2. It's but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. What are the priests? The priests are the ones who go before God. So he's saying, all of you who are part of my family get to come before God. Your royal priesthood, a holy nation. What does it mean to be holy? It means to be set apart. You're set apart for God. It's not just the Jews or the Gen- Jews anymore. It's but the Gentiles. It's us, a people belonging to God. Why? So that we could de- declare his praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, into his family. It goes on, it says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You belong at the table. You belong to his family. So what can we learn about what this means to be a part of God's family? We're going to continue to look in Ephesians, and so you can turn to Ephesians 1 again, and we're going to look at what does it mean that we are now his family. Remember all the things we talked about last night, but we're going to start now in verse 13. And it says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance into the redemption of those who are God's possessions to the praise of his glory. I love this. It says, and you also were included in Christ. So you're included in Christ. But when were you included? You were included when you heard the word, when you heard the truth, when you heard the gospel. And what had to happen in order for you to be included? It says, as it continues on, it says, having believed. So first, you were included in Christ when you heard the gospel and you decided to believe. What does it continue on to say? It says, having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. So what does this mean? that you've been marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit. I want to go back to John, the book of John. You don't have to turn there. But remember, Jesus is talking to his disciples in John, and he's saying, it's better that I go. I can't imagine this reality that he's saying, it's better that I go, because I would have loved to sit with Jesus. I would have loved to touch him, to listen to him, to be able to ask him questions face to face but he's saying it's actually better that I go because when I go, I can send a comforter. I can send you the Holy Spirit. Why? Because when Jesus was here on the earth, he could only be in one place at one time. He was a physical man. And now he's saying, listen, I'm going to give you all the Holy Spirit. All of those you who have believed are going to get the Holy Spirit are going to be sealed with the Holy Spirit. And as we look at this idea of sealing, in the, Old, in the New Testament, there were four, uh, four ways that they used to talk about sealing. So letters were often sealed, and they were sealed with a signet ring of a king. Why? To guarantee that it was a genuine letter from the king. Right? So the king would write a letter, the scroll, his scribe would write the letter, He would roll up the letter. The king would take his ring, put it in wax, and mark it on the seal. And he would close that letter up. And then that letter would be delivered to whoever it was intended for. And the only person who could open it was the person it was intended to. And so this this seal is a guarantee that it is a genuine thing. The second place that seals were used in the New Testament is placed on goods or merchandise that were traveling from one place to another to indicate who that belonged to. So what is Paul saying? He's saying now you belong to God. You belong to Jesus because you have the seal of the Holy Spirit. So it's an indication of ownership. 
The third way, we have this also in today's time, right? We have ranchers who brand their cattle. We have, um, you make, a, make some clothing. You might have, when you went to camp as a little kid, your mom might have written your name on your clothing. This is, this is Stacy's underwear. Nobody else can have it, right? It guarantees that it belongs to, to me. The third way we have is, is that sometimes um, it was placed to show that this something was authentic or is approved by. So I think about the fact that when I moved into my house in Colorado, we, we decided to um, fix the basement. The basement was completely empty. We decided to make it an apartment so that we could have some young gals live in our basement who couldn't afford rent. Uh, but while we were building it, we needed to get it approved by the inspector to make sure that it was done properly. And so this is the same thing. It was, it, a, seal was, was a seal was put on something to say that it was approved of, that now it can be used. And the fourth way that the seal was put on it in the, in the New Testament was a seal was put on something for protection or to warn. Remember when Jesus was put in the tomb? Pilate told the soldiers to put a pers his personal seal on that tomb to warn people to stay away. Don't come by. So the reality is, is Paul is saying, listen, I've given you my Holy Spirit as a seal to show that it's genuine, that there's, you, own, you are now owned by the Holy Spirit, by Jesus himself, that you belong to the family, that you're approved of, and it provides protection from the work of the enemy. But why are you sealed? What does it say? It says you are sealed. If I go back, it says you are sealed you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. So he's saying, I'm guaranteeing that one day you are going to be home like you've never been home. One day you're going to be with your father in heaven who loves you, who, who cares for you, who has already shown that you belong to him. You are marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes to everyone. We see this Holy Spirit comes to everyone when they first believe, right? This is a promise. So what does the Holy Spirit do in our lives? The Holy Spirit regenerates us. He makes us new. The Holy Spirit indwells within us. We already talked about this. For he lives with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes us. He seals us. These are the things that the Holy Spirit does. But if we go on, and I'm going to skip a few places in Ephesians, we'll come back to Ephesians 1 tomorrow morning, but I want us to turn ahead to Ephesians 5.18 because I think this ties together. So you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. You're sealed, guaranteeing that one day you'll get to be home in heaven with God, right? But now he's saying, not only do you need to be indwelt with the Spirit and sealed with the Spirit, but you need to be filled. I love, love, love this passage of Scripture. And I think sometimes people used it in the past. I remember growing up and, and hearing this Scripture saying, well, you can't drink. Drinking is wrong. It's a sin. You'll go to hell if you drink. But I believe that, Je that Paul is trying to say something completely different than this. He's saying, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, instead be filled with the Spirit. So here's, here's a reality, right? Let's say this is wine, and I drink a sip. What happens to me? Not much. But let's say I drink two of these. What happens to me now? I, I will not be able to talk. I'll probably not be able to walk. The way I think changes, the way I act changes, my attitude changes. I might get angry or maybe I'll fall asleep. I don't know. I've never tried it. I wouldn't recommend it. But literally, it changes everything about me. So what is Paul saying? Paul is saying, don't get drunk on wine because it leads to bad things. It changes everything about who you are. 
but he says, be filled with the spirit. It's this idea of this present continuous that you need to be filled with the spirit, that there's, it's not something you can manufacture because there's a passiveness of the word be. Be is a passive um, verb, but so you can't manufacture what happens, but it's filled, which is a command. So be filled and it says be being filled. It's this idea, it's this present continuous that you need to continually be filled. So he's saying, if you wanna be drunk tomorrow, so I get drunk tonight, I wake up in the morning, I'm no longer drunk. So what do I need to do in order to be drunk again? I need to keep drinking and drinking and drinking. And he's contrasting this and he's saying, I want you to drink of the wine of the Spirit. I want you to drink of the Holy Spirit because I want it to affect everything about you, the way you talk, the way you walk, your attitudes, the way you interact with your family, the way, the way you work, the way you serve, everything about you needs to change. And the reality is, is that we know that we leak. We leak the Holy Spirit. I could tell you stories after stories of times when I've made mistakes because I wasn't drinking of the wine of the Spirit. In times of stress, times of transition. I remember a time in particular I was in Kurdistan. It's not my finest moment, so please don't tell on me. (laughs) But I had a bunch of interns that I was driving with. And I wasn't, I hadn't been drinking of the Spirit of the Lord. I'd gotten busy in doing life, and we had had a tragedy in our town, and I was grieving. And I was driving with these interns in the back of my car, and somebody Uh, cuts me off in the bazaar. And my immediate reaction is to flip that driver off. (laughs) And all of a sudden, I said, hmm, what's going on in my heart? Something's wrong. The Holy Spirit's not in work within me because I'm not showing love. I'm just acting out of my anger, out of my pain. I wasn't drinking of the Spirit of God, so it wasn't affecting everything about who I was. We know that we leak. And we know that we need to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't get drunk on wine, but be being filled with the Spirit. Because the Spirit of God wants to change everything about who you are and make you new and transform you. So we talked about this reality of the fact that we need to be being filled with the Spirit, this continuous thing, so that we can be completely transformed. But why? Why do we need this? I'm sorry, I realized I didn't put on the pictures that I wanted to show you. I wanted to show you some pictures of some of my dearest friends, my family in Kurdistan. I told you about this family that adopted me in. I was living, I got to live with them for a period of time while I was learning language and it was a cultural immersion and a language immersion and and they basically welcomed me in and they said, Stacy, we are your family. You are our daughter, you're our sister, you're our aunt to our kids. And I never really understood what family meant or what the family of God meant until I lived with them. And I realized that in being a part of their family, there was also responsibility. That I had to do things um, that would show my love and affection to them. That I had to be a part of everything that they did. So when they had spring cleaning, even though I didn't live with them, I had to go to their house and, and do spring cleaning. We had to beat carpets and wash floors and walls. When my Kurdish grandmother died, I came and I sat with them for three days. I served our family and friends who came to mourn and grieve because I was a part of the family. There was a completeness of being a part of them. And I knew that because I was a part of them, that they loved me and that they would protect me even with their life. One of the things about Middle Eastern culture and you can even see it from Psalms 23, is this reality that when you're a part of somebody's 
family, like they literally do everything for you and they will protect you. So what does it mean that we're a part of God's family? And how does that change us? Not only does it, do, do we get the Holy Spirit indwelling with us, we also have to be filled with the Spirit. So, so why? We need to be filled with the Spirit so that we can be on mission, so that we can be set apart and made holy, be sanctified. But it's also this reality that the God has a mission for us. And when we're filled with the Spirit, we literally transform. I'm not going to read all of these scriptures, and we're going to kind of walk through this really quickly, but I want you to understand that as we look at these passages of scriptures, we see many times in the book of Acts, we see that the early church was filled with the Spirit, and then they were filled again, and they were filled again, and they were filled again. And we see that they completely changed. So one of the things that happens is when they were filled with the Spirit, they proclaimed Jesus boldly and with power. They spoke in tongues. There was tongues of fire on them. 3,000 people were added to their numbers daily. They were, they were bold in their speech. Literally everything about them changed. You can take a picture of this slide if you want, and you can look up these passages of scriptures because I think it's just neat. If you read through the book of Acts, I would encourage you to begin thinking through what happened when the Spirit came and how were people changed? So we see a change in the life of the disciples. Remember Peter? I love Peter. I think Peter, I often can act like Peter. Remember Peter, when Jesus was crucified, how he cowered in fear and he denied Christ over and over and over again. But what happens when the Spirit comes? We see Peter literally filled with the Spirit. He literally goes from a man who cowers in fear to a man who speaks boldly. He speaks boldly before the Sanhedrin. He speaks boldly through, through, in front of all the people who had gathered when, when the Spirit came upon them. We see that people are given direction. They're told what to do. I don't know about you, but there are many times when I need direction, when I have to stop and listen and say, God, what do you want me to do? And I love that the Holy Spirit loves to speak to us. He loves to give us direction. We see this in in Philip. Philip was told to go to a place, and what happens when he goes to that place? He encounters a eunuch where he's able to share the gospel with him, and that, that guy came to faith, and he baptized him at that very moment. We see the apostles given directions of where to go, to go to a city or to not go to a city. When, and maybe they were even intended to go to one place, but instead they went to someplace else because the Spirit told them. My husband and I are in a time of discernment. Um, many of you have asked where I live. I actually live in Colorado Springs, um, where the national office of the CMA used to be. And Last year, it moved to Columbus or Reynoldsburg, Ohio. My husband and I are are in a time of discernment saying, God, what do you have for us? We knew that God had called us to Colorado for my job. And now we're saying, God, something has shifted. We want to follow you. So we're listening and we're praying and we're seeking God. And I know that he's going to speak. God speaks to me in in dreams often. and, And I think... Um, I had a dream a couple, couple months ago, probably about five, six weeks ago now, and I re- very clearly heard God speak to me. And he showed me something that was going to happen, and three weeks later it actually happened, but I think the Lord was trying to remind me, Stacy, you know that I speak to you. I will give you direction. I know that you're seeking me. And so I want to remind you that when you're filled with the Spirit, the voice of God speaks to you, that he will give you direction, he will give you discernment, he will lead you even when you don't know what to do or where to go. What else? When the Holy Spirit fills the disciples and the apostles, they saw and confronted sin. You know the story of Ananias and Sapphira. 
where they lied to the church. And they said, this is all the money we have from when we sold our house. And, and that church family, they knew they lied. And the Spirit told them that, and they confronted sin. I love this next one, healing. Over and over and over again, we see that the Holy Spirit allows. When the Holy Spirit comes, when the Holy Spirit fills, people are healed, people are transformed. But this one is interesting from Acts 14. Acts 14, I'm actually going to turn there because I love, I love this passage of Scripture. It's Acts 14, 8 through 10. It says, In Lystra, there sat a crippled man his feet, in his feet, who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul, and as he was speaking, Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. I find it interesting that he said they saw He saw that he had faith to be healed. What does it look like to see that this person had faith to be healed? Have you ever thought about that? Was there a look on his face, something in his eyes? But the Spirit of God allowed him to see in the heavenly realms that this man had faith to be healed. And he, when Paul commanded him, he got up and he was healed. We also see that when the Holy Spirit comes, we see the ministry of the body. We see fellowship. We see salvation. We see that they shared everything in common. And I want to land really quickly. This is from Acts 2.42. You guys know this passage of Scripture. It's not new. But I want to talk about this word fellowship. Because we talk about belonging. We talk about being a part of the family of God. And I want us to think, what does it really mean to have fellowship. Fellowship is participative. Like we all need to participate and it's this mutual back and forth. It's not just one person participating, but it's all of us participating. It's this idea that we're going to spur each other on, that we're going to encourage each other on and continually point each other to Jesus. We're going to worship together. We're going to have accountability. We're going to celebrate each other's successes we're going, we're going to mourn together. We're going to, we're going to be there for each other. Can you imagine one day in heaven when we're all together, what that fellowship is going to look like? We have a glimpse, a small glimpse of what that looks like. My best friend and I, her name is Jen. I actually have two best friends named Jen. Um, the three of us, said, we want to do life together. And we, wanna, we want to know and be known by each other. And so one of the things that we did a number of years ago, five or six years ago now, is that we said, we want, I want to tell you everything about my whole life, the good and the bad and the ugly, because I want you to know me. And I want to know that even in the knowing of everything about me, that you love me deeply. And they listened to my story as I told them my story. And I listened to their story as they told me theirs. And we spoke truth over each other and forgiveness and love. Something similar that I did with my husband when we were dating. And the thing that I know about these people, these three people, my husband and Jen and Jen, is that they fully know me and they fully love me. And we have true fellowship. Won't it be beautiful when that's reality in all of heaven, when we're fully known and fully loved and we have fellowship? And the seventh thing that I want to talk about is that when you're filled with the Spirit, you will be his witnesses. Maybe when was the last time you witnessed about Jesus? When you were able to tell somebody, let me tell you about, let me tell you about my best friend. Let me tell you about who he is. I think we often witness about a lot of things, right? Maybe we wear a shirt that talks about a sports team, or maybe we 
when we have a, a grand, grandchild, we, we show a picture and we want everybody to see a picture of, the, of this grandchild. We're witnessing about who this person is because this person is so important to us, right? Or when somebody gets engaged, they walk around and they show their hand and say, have you seen my ring? I'm witnessing about this. But I believe that when we're filled with the Spirit, that we will be his witnesses. There's a lost and dying world desperate for Jesus. We will be his witnesses. And the question that I want to ask all of us, I want us to wrestle with this, wrestle with the reality that we often leak the Holy Spirit and we need to be filled again and again and again. And the reality is, is that we will see all of these things in our lives when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And so maybe we need a fresh filling of the Spirit. Maybe we need more of Jesus. And the reality is, if we continue on in Acts, I love, love, love this passage of Scripture. It's one that we as the Alliance use, Acts 1.8, but I want to go first to Acts 1.4. And it starts in the middle of four. It says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Wait for the gift. Wait for the gift. We all receive the indwelling Holy Spirit at salvation when we believed. We all need to be filled again and again. And he's saying, I want you to wait. I want you to long for more of the Holy Spirit's presence so that it can empower you to follow after Jesus, to be transformed into his likeness, to be on mission, to make witnesses. And so the question that I want to ask myself and I want to ask you is, are you living in the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Or do you need to drink today? and keep drinking, and keep drinking. One of my other favorite passages of scripture comes from Luke, Luke 11. And I'm going to kind of close here tonight as I see the time is ending. It's Luke 11. And it starts in verse 9. It says, So I say to you, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. I think a lot of times people talk about this passage of Scripture in regards to salvation. If you seek God, you'll find him. Where I think there's maybe some truth to this, but let's continue on because I think there's something greater that that Jesus is trying to tell us. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, find. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? All you have to do is ask. Ask the Father for the Holy Spirit and wait. Terry, don't just, don't just wait And say, I'm going to wait for a couple minutes and and see if the Holy Spirit comes. But wait and wait and keep asking and wait intentionally because the Holy Spirit, the Father says he wants to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. And I think in our lives, in my life, I can tell when I need to be filled. I think you guys can tell too. But what would it look like? How would our lives be transformed if we waited with intentionality and daily drank of the Holy Spirit? My prayer for all of us is that we would drink and that we would drink and that we would drink so that every bit of our being is affected so that we're literally transformed, so that we live in true fellowship, so that even though maybe you don't know each other and you're from vastly different parts of the district, 
that you would have true fellowship and love and community, that you would know and be known, that you would be filled with the Spirit so that you're literally transformed, so that even though you're maybe fearful at times to speak about, the, about Jesus and your relationship with Jesus, it just comes out of, your, out of your mouth and you can't help but speak. I know I want more of the Holy Spirit. And he just says, just ask. And you'll receive. Just wait and keep asking. He's a good father who wants to give you good gifts. So let me pray for you. And then I think we're going to move on to communion. God, I'm desperate for you. I need you. But I know that the song, um, Lord, I need you every hour, but it's more like every minute and every second that I need you. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come that you'd fall on my sisters, that you'd fill them daily, that they would long for you and long and wait expectantly for you to come. So come, Holy Spirit. We invite you. Fill us up. In Jesus' name, amen.